Most of the Bible is from the 9th century onwards. So we're talking about a huge gap. Yeah. You know, imagine this discussion we're having today. Try to remember it next week. Yeah. Forget about 100 years, forget yeah. about 200 years. years. Nearly a millennia. Yeah. yeah. And the same thing is with the Old Testament. The Old Testament between Moses and the earliest extant manuscript, which I think is the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's like 1400 years. 1200 years. I mean, it's more than a thousand years, definitely. Now, how can you say that nothing has changed since? You know, after all, not only the fact that they don't have the original language, they don't have the, the early manuscripts, so it suffers a lot of corruption. And this cannot be said about the Quran, because the Quran, we have two modes of preservation. One is the, the primary is always the oral, the oral tradition, which means they literally memorize the Quran, like the brother was just saying. Yeah. Like every Ramadan, we recite the entire Quran in every, almost every mosque, even in Britain, yeah. yeah, let alone in Muslim countries. And this is like a tradition we have in Ramadan. And at any point, there are something like 20 million people who know it by heart. Yeah. yeah, and we are talking about ranging from small children as young as six years old, seven years old, who memorize the entire Quran cover to cover. Yes, to grown ups, to elderly. And when you have such a huge crowd of people, it is like, uh, I mean, just to give you a crude idea, you know, imagine if you read any nursery poetry, nursery rhymes, and you know this by heart, you know it. So if somebody recites, say, for example, Twinkle, Twinkle, a little star or something, you know, and they make a mistake, and then you will be able to correct them immediately, isn't it? Because you know it since you were a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with the Quran. You know, not only like children know, and they are actually correcting elders who make mistakes because they learned it quite well at a young age, and this is prevalent throughout the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world today. In every corner of the world, you'll find someone who's memorized the Quran. So. We have one mode, which is the oral tradition, and the other is obviously the written tradition. So we have the earliest manuscripts of the Quran dating back to the time of Prophet peace be upon him. So 1400-year-old Qurans yeah. from the first century of Asia. And one of them is actually here in UK. It's in the Birmingham University. Wow. Yeah, they didn't know it was uh, such an old manuscript. Yeah. So one day what happened was somebody was just looking through it, and they said, let's send this for carbon dating. And it turned out it was one of the earliest Qurans. Wow. Yeah, they were all shocked. <laughs> this was like eight years ago they discovered this. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, because these manuscripts, mm -hmm. they travel all around the world because people, you know, they sell, they exchange, they exchange hands. So we have written and we have oral as well. And what is the most important bit is one thing again unique in the Quran, uh, in contrast to the Bible, is the fact that Allah Himself, God Almighty Himself says in the Quran that it is we who have revealed the Quran and it is we who will preserve it. So now if God gives his own guarantee of preservation, then it is unlikely for anyone to then corrupt it. Yeah. So Allah says in uh, chapter 15 verse 9, which is we send the, the, the revelation and we surely will preserve it. So we got now three modes of preservation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. One is the oral, the other is the written, and most important, God himself. Yeah. And this guarantee of preservation, you'll not find it in the Bible. You'll not find it in any other holy scriptures which claims to be from God. Yeah, because you see, we, we as Muslims, we believe there were previous scriptures. So the Bible, for example, the Bible, even though it's not mentioned as a Bible in the Quran, Allah mentions that the Torah and the Injil, so the Torah, obviously you know what the Torah is, given to Moses, a revelation to Moses, and we believe the Injil is a revelation to Jesus. Now, what the Christians call the New Testament is not the Injil. The reason for that is because the Injil was actually revealed to Jesus, and he's the one who preached it. What is the... Gospels today, Gospel according to Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. There's no Gospel according to Jesus, is there? So this came much later. And like I said, the Gospels themselves, the Gospel of John, this is written something like 90 years after or something. So, and we have no manuscripts of this. This is just a claim of this. So we are going based on two things. One is hearsay, and the other is much later uh, writings, which you cannot say is eyewitness accounts. And that's the reason, you see, the reason they say it's according to Mark, yeah. according to Matthew, according to Luke, 
and according to John, not by Matthew or John. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What was your name? I'm Lucas. Lucas. I'm Hashim. Hashim. Hashim you are Ben. 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 Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you for talking. Yeah. So I don't know. You guys already got the Quran there. Yes. So yeah. we don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you guys are going for photography yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, what, so I'm curious. What brings you here? Like, what is your goal yeah. through having this booth? through talking to us, what is your objective? Right, so our objective is quite plain from, as you can see from this uh, podium here, it says free Quran. Yeah. So we want to propagate Islam, the message of Islam. Yeah. There's a lot of misinformation and misrepresentation uh, of Islam today because of, well, the media mostly. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, like everything. And we want to actually give them the right interpretation of Islam, the right message about Islam, not something that has been construed yeah. or from, from a third party. So we don't want according to someone else, right. you know, we, we want the message by the Muslims, yeah, to everyone. Yeah. And because we know that Islam is something that is universal in its uh, message. So it doesn't, it's not like the Bible where it says, here, O Israel, your Lord God is one. Right. You know, that means that message was directed for whom? For the people of Israel, the Bani Israel, you know, the children of Jacob. Because Israel is another name for Jacob. I don't know if you know that, but it's like the Bani Israel as a particular tribe yeah. yeah and we say as Muslims that today the message of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him who is the last messenger yeah he was given the last revelation which is a Quran and this message is universal yeah. Yeah. so we propagate Islam to everyone regardless of the background the race the religion the ideologies doesn't matter what it is and not to a particular tribe or particular people or particular race or color whatever it is it's universal because you see just like it says here, O Israel, in the Bible, uh, in the Quran, Allah says, Yeah, ayyuhan nas, means here, O people. Yeah. Yes? Anyway. Which means it's a universal message. Right. And that is what we try to propagate. And we want to do away with all the misunderstanding about Islam. Yeah. So, just like you guys are asking questions, a lot of people come and ask questions about Islam, about the Quran, about the Hadith. And we try our best to portray the message in the right manner. Yeah. Uh, and without, you know, we don't need to be apologetic all the time there are many things in Islam today the uh, with this secular environment that we live in today they might not agree with yeah so many things you know Islam has prohibited for example it prohibits alcohol it prohibits adultery fornication obviously murder rape all those things which are common yeah. but all those things which Islam has prohibited you know you will see some intrinsic benefit in that yeah, I mean, take alcohol for example. Today it's become a norm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like a culture in this country. I'm sure if they stop people going to the pubs, they will revolt. Yeah. <laughs> they saw be... that happen in the America. They... Yeah, exactly. It was it in the 60s or something? Yeah. 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 yeah, I guess from America. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it happened in the 60s. And they started breaking everything, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess all the leaders, all the presidents, they were still drinking. They still got to do whatever they want. Well, yeah, of course. They, they are the kind of people who say, do as we say, not not as we do. Yes. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I think this is something which, again, Islam tells you not to do something because you, God Almighty knows what is good and bad for you. Now, there has been a lot of uh, studies in alcohol, the benefits and the harm. And there has been a recent publication with regards to consumption of alcohol, even in small quantities. And this was actually published in The Lancet. The Lancet is one of the most respected medical journals and they said that no amount of alcohol is good for you and everyone was shocked like how you know my mom told me or my doctor told me a bit of wine is good for your heart <laughs> but they forgot to tell you how bad it's for your liver right. exactly. <laughs> exactly. so it's, it's kind of selective so it's like Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Like brother. Jazakallah khair. what does the Quran say about tattoos does it have any restrictions like alcohol yeah I mean tattoos are bad for you you know it's bad for your skin a lot of people get irritations after getting getting a tattoo and they have a, a lot of problems throughout their life. You know, God tells you that your body is given to you and you should respect that. It is your, it is an amana, it is like a, it is a trust for you that you should take care of. So do not abuse it. Yes, just because it has been given to you for a purpose, it, you have to not abuse it. And one of the worst ways to abuse it is to believe in God or worship in God that are false.
Yeah. That is the worst way. So in Islam, we consider shirk to be the highest, uh, the highest uh, sin, the the greatest sin. You know what shirk? Uh, I don't know, but I know from the story of the golden calf, yeah. which is, I think, similar. Uh, very good, mashallah, very good. That's actually the second chapter in the Quran. It's called yeah. Al-Baqarah. You know, it means the cow. Yeah. yeah? Uh, so this is, uh, the shirk basically just means associating partners with God. Anything. That goes with, even if you are a materialistic, you don't, li you might be an atheist, might be following, uh, I don't know, not following any ideology. But you would still consider certain things of value in your life for which you would work very hard. Yeah? And many people today are materialistic. They would work. I don't know, 9 to 12 jobs, you know, like whatever it is, and they would give all their focus and concentration on that. Yes, in Islam it's different. Islam doesn't tell you not to work, but it tells you at the same time you should also worship God. So as Muslims we pray five times a day. What does that mean? It means your day is divided into five different sections, and at every interval of that five sections, you remember and reconnect with God. In the meantime, after that and before that, you can carry on your daily work. Yeah, as long as it's obviously it's legal and it's something which is halal, which means you do not work for maybe a, com uh, a company that sells alcohol. Because Islam prohibits alcohol and you start working for the company, it defeats the purpose, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was telling you about the prohibitions earlier. You know, like all these things which Islam has prohibited, it is something which, if you look at it objectively, it makes sense. And then you will realize that why would God want to prohibit this? At the end of the day, God wants a good, uh, the, uh, sorry, your, for your benefit, so that you do not fall into a situation where it harms your body or it harms somebody else. Because you see, you might not be drinking, but then somebody else might be drinking and he's driving the car and he hits you. Yeah. yeah? You both are impacted, aren't you? So it destroys two lives, might destroy two families. Yeah? And this is something that we do not even reflect on unless it happens to us. So that's the reason when God nips it in the bud. Same thing with adultery. Yeah? Somebody might be having fun with somebody else's wife. Yeah? But then he doesn't know that he's destroying another family there. Yeah? And this is all of it. You know, there's always a, a reaction to whatever action you do. And if this action of yours is something which is contrary to what God has told you to do, or when God tells you that this is prohibited and you still continue doing that, then it's going to impact you and others as well. And this is how societies are destroyed. If you look today, there are so many divorces in our societies, especially in America. I was about to say, like, what, yeah. is, what is your thoughts on divorce? Yeah, I think it's something like, what, 50% in America? 42. So, uh, 42? Well, right. close enough, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> practically, that's that's well, practically it's like... Actually the number. What? The, the number is getting higher. Yeah. Yeah. Every year, yeah. It's practically like every in every two marriages, one breaks up. Right. It's that bad. Right. Now, can you imagine what happens to the children? We know. Yeah. Oh, you both? Yeah, we're... Oh, sorry, okay. Brothers from another mother, quite literally. That's right, right. what we are. So brothers yeah. from different families. Our parents got married, and then they divorced, and then yeah. or now they're off, but they left us, and then our other parents divorced. It's a whole mess. No, we, no. we know our family know was divorced, basically... Yeah. So you guys you guys yeah. know first time yes, yes, what, what the impact of that is. Yeah. And this is, you see, family unit is something that is treasured in Islam. Right. Yeah? And for us to... Even the brotherhood within within the Muslim brother, like all of these brothers, you know, they come on Sundays here. Right. We don't know each other personally, but we, we are united for one purpose, which is like to give the message of Islam, the true message of Islam to everyone. So it builds a kind of a brotherhood with you. But again, the family unit is, is treasured and is something which is the most important for us. Yeah. In the Quran, Allah says, uh, do not even say oof to your mother, to your, to your parents. And it's, it's basically literally next to the, the uh, the passage, or, or sorry, is in the same passage where it talks about worship of one God, and then he says, "Do not be, um, uh, uh, sorry, do, do, do not uh, mistreat your parents." In the same verse, can you believe it? That's how important it is. Yeah. So the the family unit, even the respect for your parents, is something highly valued, and in and particular respect to the mothers, because once a companion of the Prophet peace be upon him asked him who who deserves my company most, or to whom should be I be giving more uh, honor and respect to, and Prophet peace be upon him says your mother, and then. He, the companion asks him, who next? And he says, your mother. And he asks, who next? And then he says, on the third occasion, your father. Yeah. And this shows us the importance of mother. Because, you know, most of us, I don't know how long you guys live with your moms, but they they don't actually advertise or they don't 
you know, show off about the the, uh, uh, the sacrifices they have given for us. Yes, just within the pregnancy itself, before you even saw the world, they were already sacrificing for you. And that is the reason Allah, uh, peace be upon, uh, sorry, Allah and the Prophet, peace be upon him, they actually shows us the importance of motherhood in the family, within the family. And the family unit, both with the siblings, how to deal with them, everything. You know, many people, when they hear the term Sharia, they think it's just the penal punishments and uh, all that. That is only like a small fraction yeah. of the Sharia. So if you have a pie chart, it will be like maybe 2% of that. The rest is how to deal with your family, how to deal with your neighbors. Like even if my neighbor was maybe an atheist, you know, and he was like going to sleep without eating, yeah, it would be my fault. I would be held accountable for that. If I go to bed on full stomach and he goes on an empty stomach, yeah. then I would be the one accountable. In fact, there's a hadith that says that you're not even a believer if you do that. And this guy, my neighbor, could be someone who is an atheist. Yeah, he could be a non-believer, yeah. completely. But yet, because of humanity, yeah, the fact that he's a human, he needs food, he needs uh, obviously to survive, then it is my duty as a human being and as a Muslim in particular to make sure that he doesn't go to bed empty on an empty stomach. So all of this constitutes Sharia, you know. For us, worship doesn't just mean you go to the mosque, can you pray five times a day and that's it worship means submission to the will of God yeah. and what does that mean that everything that God has told you to do and what he has prohibited you to do you just follow that and that would like I said it would entail uh, respect and love for your family for your friends for your neighbors all of that and this is what Sharia truly is but when you hear on media the Sharia you know immediately yeah. all the negativity comes up as if all the Muslims in the world if they really were that bad then you wouldn't have two billion Muslims nearly what quarter of the population of the world yes going about and then all the others are safe yeah yeah you wouldn't have that and this is you know that's that's where we actually that's one of the reasons we come to speakers corner on Sundays to propagate this true message of God so I don't know have you guys given a thought to what will happen to you after you guys die I know it's a bit of a yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's one of those questions which people don't like you know yeah, but it's the reality you know we talk about it. I live I, I try and live my life in a just way giving what I can to others and I hope that if there is a God whoever that might be yeah. um, that they see my life in a just manner right. and if there is no God then that's just okay fair enough happens. yeah so I was talking to Abdullah and I basically said that the my like shift in religion essentially was I used to be kind of a nihilist and then I decided that I had to make a change in my life to a nihilist really yeah a little oh, bit you know? and so I had to, I, right and so I had to get my life back together and okay. you know I was kind of falling down a slope and so to get it back together I had to realize that there was in some way somebody was watching or that there was something important that you know whether it be at the end of my life or every day that I had to make these changes and really deep down I think that they're for me and for the world and the way that I impact the world right the better person I am the better I'm going to be to everybody around me and so honestly the way that I see it is that after I die it doesn't matter as much and hopefully I'll be rewarded for all the good that I do right but after I die it doesn't matter as much because I try to live every single day doing my best to get to wherever it is that I need to go right to impact people around me yeah no I'm, I'm pretty I, I would see I, it. I'm glad you you but came up don't believe even an right? No, no, of course. That's the way that I, yeah. that's my philosophy. So. No, it's good. I think you, you pretty much answered similar. Yes. Yeah. Uh, your answers were similar. But I'm, I'm glad you came out of that hellhole of nihilism. That's terrible. Yeah, yeah it's terrible. because it's, it's, it defeats the purpose of our existence, isn't yeah. it? Like, if you don't have a purpose, yeah. then you'll become a nihilist. You become, basically, you, you don't you don't trust anyone. You you kind of are skeptical about everything, isn't it? And that's, that's a pretty, I would say, toxic way to live. Yeah. Because this toxicity not only rubs on you it rubs on other people isn't it because you if you have friends then you probably will be discussing all these things yeah, I lost all my friends there you go yeah so it's, it's not a it's not a good thing and that's the reason you know Allah tells us in the Quran like that's not a big book it's not it's not as big as the Bible or, or other scriptures of other religions it's very concise and tells without beating around the bush Allah tells you the purpose of your existence that it is to worship Allah what does that mean as I told you earlier, worship doesn't just mean we pray in the mosque. It's basically all your responsibilities to your family, your friends, your neighbors, everything. And it goes about like even your daily daily wages that you earn, your, your jobs that you do. That itself is worship as long as it's within the confines of what is permitted. Yeah. And all of this is worship. So 
for us, you know, before we pray, I don't know if you know this, we we call it ablution, we call it wudu in Arabic, which is uh, you is, is a ritual washing. So the hadith says that every drop that falls from the washing of your of your limbs itself is like expiating your sins. So every single thing you do, like I said, within the confine of the religion, God gives you rewards for it that will benefit you in the hereafter. Now, the reason I ask you about hereafter is like, we know for sure, it doesn't matter if you're a nihilist, atheist, agnostic, uh, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, it doesn't matter. Whatever religion or ideology you follow, one thing is certain, death. Yeah? No one can deny that, right? Doesn't matter if they deny God, but they can't deny that. And that's the reason I asked you, what do you believe about afterlife? And again, you know, we believe that because God is fair and just, he would tell us, isn't it? Like what to expect in the afterlife and how we can make the most of it. Because if we believe that this life, temporary life of ours is going to come to an end one day, then surely there must be something else. Because if that came to an end, that was the purpose of all these rules. Makes no sense, isn't it? And that's how many atheists think, that we will become dust and that's the end of it. You know, if that was the end of it, then someone who believes in God and follows all the rules, not all, at least, let's say most of the rules and all, then it wouldn't be any different, isn't it? Because both of them became dust at the end. But if we flip the coin now, you know, if we flip the situation, that there is an afterlife, that there are angels and there is punishment and reward, and there is obviously God Almighty who's going to be the judge of everyone, and he's just, which means he will hold you accountable for all the bad deeds you did, and he'll reward you for all the good deeds you did, and there's going to be consequences for the bad and reward for the good. Then there's a huge problem for that atheist or agnostic, isn't it? Yeah. Because then you're taking a huge risk. Right. Yeah? Because if you ask a person... Still living my life in a just manner. Yeah. Is that still... You, you mentioned that that's still a sin of, um, if you don't believe in... No, but when you say a good life yeah. in a just way, according to whose criteria? Yeah. Ah. Who says what is good and bad? Because yeah. what might be good for you might be bad for you. You see what I mean? It's subjective. Because uh, we spoke about alcohol earlier, isn't it? Right. Too many people, it's good, you know, yeah, a yeah. bit of entertainment. <laughs> they don't see it as bad. Yeah. But when you look at holistically, and even through the scientific uh, evidence presented to them, they will still be in denial. Yeah. And I've literally seen this. I've shown them the actual passage, sorry, the, the actual uh, rec uh, reports from the uh, fr from these peer-reviewed journals, mm -hmm. from the Lancet. Yeah. And yet they'll deny it. You know why? Because they have somehow convinced themselves that that is good because that is what they have been oriented with all their life. Yeah. So when you both said about yeah, when you both said about you, you're, you're being a good human being. You know, you help around wherever you can, whatever. Yeah. But that is based on your upbringing. Yeah. Yeah. If your upbringing was in some other country, in some other village, in some other time, maybe your worldview would be completely different, yeah. isn't it? Like today, many women, you know, they wear all sorts of uh, reveal, revealing clothes. If you went maybe 100, 200 years ago, or even in the Victorian era, yes, that would be someone who would be a very bad woman. Yeah. Why? Because time has changed, yeah. the fashion has changed, and their mindset has changed. So you do not become a slave of fashion. You don't become a slave of uh, whatever is in vogue at, at present, the, our time. You remain consistent, your morality remains consistent if you follow God Almighty. And that is the reason it's very important for us to go about our daily life based on the injunctions given by Almighty God. That way we don't change our morality as the fashion changes, yes, as the time changes. Mm -hmm. And that is the truth, isn't it? Because morality, if something is wrong intrinsically, then it should be wrong for all times. It's not something that, that changes, you know, you don't keep changing it then they, it loses the meaning of what's moral, what's immoral. And this is quite important for us. And that is how we, we align the purpose of our existence with what which we should expect in the hereafter. Yeah? And because, like I said, God is not going to be unjust to anyone. Everyone will be accountable. And what it, if you remember, the biggest sin is what? To associate partners with Almighty God. So you can say, look, I'm living a wonderful life, but you are 
missing out on the most basic fundamental thing, which is rejecting the Almighty God, and that will be the biggest sin. So it doesn't matter how many goods you do, you know. If there was uh, someone that was born in a culture and never heard the Quran and yeah. never heard the word, yeah. would that still be considered a sin? No. Would God, would God we we say God is just for a reason. You yeah. see, on the day of judgment, God is going to judge them in a different way to us. Mm -hmm. Because if we got the information about Islam, and if we got the information about the do's and the don'ts, and they did not, then it wouldn't be fair to judge both of us yeah. in the same manner, is it? Right. So God has his own judgment for them, and he's going to test them actually. Yeah. Yes, and based on that test, then he decides. Because like I said, he doesn't want to be unjust to anyone. That's not, not his nature. Yeah. So yes, it's a good question, but we are talking about exceptions. Today, I don't think there's any house which wouldn't know about Islam. And you know, this was one of the prophecies of Prophet, peace be upon him. He said, there will not be a single house in which Islam has not entered. Yeah. I have a question here. So, yeah, sure. I'm uh, reading a book recently. Uh, you know Dostoevsky. You read Dostoevsky, Russian author. No, I haven't. Um, essentially, it's an 1850s Russian story. Okay. And you know these characters, they visit a uh, they visit, visit a church, right? They visit a church house, and they're having this argument. One of the characters has written this article asking, essentially, if or he essentially states that without the premonition of immortality, there would be no mortality, or there would be no morality in man, right? If we didn't have immortality, if we didn't know about immortality, and back then they all, you know, everybody believed in immortality, right? And obviously... That oh, they changed. believed they wouldn't die? No, 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 like in the afterlife, right? Ah, oh, I see what you mean, yeah, okay. Yeah, and so if they, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, so right. if basically what he was saying is that, say that we knew that there was no afterlife, there was no immortality, that the world would be, become lawless, that everything right. would be moral, because there would be no reason to live. So my question, exactly, yeah. my question to you is say that, you know, say that we, you still believe that God exists and everything and you still follow the Quran, but say that in a hypothetical world, right, there was no afterlife, or we had just proven the afterlife. Right? Yeah. What would you say? Would the world become... That's what I just immoral? discussed earlier, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I said if there's no afterlife, yeah. and, and atheists and agnostic, they believe that, and then I believe that right. God exists, and then there's no afterlife, then we would all become dust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then there wouldn't be a problem for any of us. So I haven't taken any risk. They haven't taken much risk, right. but if they um, and I realize after that that there is God and there is an afterlife, then who's taking the biggest risk? Yeah. Right. See what I mean? But what about society in the present time? Say that everybody what about suddenly it? believed that there was no afterlife. Whether or not there was, everybody suddenly believed or thought that they discovered there was no afterlife. Do you believe that society would fall into lawlessness? Do I don't know. This is a hypo hold itself I think this is a hypothetical question. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and I doubt this will happen. No, it will Because uh, it's, it's something, look, from time immemorial uh, people have been believing in God right. and that is one of the reasons majority of the people around the world are believers in God yeah. isn't it and atheism and agnostic, agnosticism is, is there but it is in minority in comparison to the believers yeah. now why would someone in a very remote place like in, maybe in an Amazon forest you know believe in something yes it might be not the same God as I do but they believe in certain things which is gives them some sort of divine power they, they believe in some uh, supernatural being maybe why is that? Because you see, intrinsically, we all have been given this um, this potential to worship God. Yeah. yeah, the natural disposition, which we call the fitra in Arabic, and this natural disposition is we are yearning to to somehow try to find God. Yeah. This is within us all the time. Yeah. Even the atheists will ask this question. Like, does God really exist? And then they decide whether yes or no, based on their environment, based on their learning, their knowledge and so on. But if you look at it, you know, like these people, they're taking a huge risk if they think God doesn't exist. And then when reality hits them all of a sudden, after they die, that's it. They can't do much about it then. You know, at least as believers in God, we know that we are not taking the risk, we are minimizing the risk. And then we, on the day of judgment, when God, we stand alone in front of God, He's going to ask us, how did you spend the life that I had given you? Because our bodies, our life, everything belongs to God. You know, if I were to ask you to, okay, I'll give you uh, a million dollars, you give me two of your eyes, what are you going to say? Of Are you going to say no, of course, you know? Because <laughs> are you going to give? The eyes, I thought you said eyes. Like no, 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 your eyes. Yeah, yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah. Eyes, no. Yeah, yeah. Even one eye you wouldn't give. No, Forget no. about two eyes, yeah. yeah. So this is, you know the value of the things that you have, yeah? yeah? 
if if this is the value of just your eyes, can you imagine your whole body, your life, your existence itself? Yeah. And who has given you all this? It is God Almighty, you know. And the reason I say God Almighty is because that is the only plausible explanation for the existence of everything. So if I were to ask you where did the universe come from, what would you say? At this point, I'd say we're still discovering it. Yeah. But I would say that there's a potential explanation that God Almighty is there. But as I, you know, Abdullah described me as the truth seeker, right? The logical one, the one that follows yeah. the facts. So I would continue to chase those facts probably my entire life, right? And I'll, and I'll read the Quran, right? I'll read yeah. the entire book. But no, but if, you, if, if I were to ask you that, did the universe create itself, what would you say then? No. No? Did it come from nothing? Yeah, I think there's a potential. Yes. I don't know. I'm still, well, that's to still, I'm still learning. Truth I, that's why I'm no, but when you say it comes from nothing, uh, does nothing exist? Mm, no, because it's nothing. Exactly. So if something doesn't exist, how can it bring about something that does exist like the universe? Okay, so maybe it doesn't come from nothing. Okay, so we rule out nothing. We rule out existence by itself. Right. What other plausibility you have? Again, I think we're still discovering it. I mean, there's a lot of scientific theory that's going on about that. But again, I'm going to read this book, yeah, and maybe yeah. I'm going to change my mind, right? And that's Absolutely. what we're talking to you guys. So. All right. So, well, yeah, so you want to say something, Abdullah? Wanna, yeah, what's up? So. One thing I want to say, because if you were saying in terms of, you know, looking at the research and everything, right. um, if I gave you, for example, if someone, for example, you got a phone call right now, and it's from your mom, so, yeah. would you know it's from your mom? Oh yeah, I got the caller ID. Yeah, oh, okay. if you gave me the phone call. No, 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 you're from your phone. Yeah, I mean, it would come up on the contacts, right? How do you know it's not from AI or something? In this generation, it's hard to tell. So, do you go with it? So, when you do get a call, do you go through your life thinking that this person could be AI and you accept it that this is your mother? I accept that it, it's my mother. Why? I typically, until it comes out that there's a case of such a call being made, I would accept that that's my mother. But that's coming out in the news that there's fake calls coming out. But is there any distinct something? Is there anything that affects yeah, your decision? Yeah, that's because You know, her tone of voice, talking to her, her knowing things about my life, conversation, right? Okay. So. So you do do some kind of deduction. Yes, absolutely. A reasonable deduction, yeah, exactly. logical. So what I'm saying is, even for your, what I'm saying, why I'm giving this example, is that you can't see your brain. Right. Or you can hear and you so, yeah. Exactly. So in the same approach, in terms of how you look into the universe and the concept of God, you have to use the same type of reason. Because you're not going to see God. And if you can see God, then it's not God anymore. Right. Because God is beyond it. Yeah. everything. As we yeah. said, logically, right. when we went through it. So logically and rationally, is there any other explanation rationally that there is no God? Can you rationally prove there is no God? Rationally? No. I think so I by can't default. Rationally prove, I can't rationally prove the existence of God either. Why not? It's, I mean, it's impossible to prove that something doesn't exist. The burden of proof is on someone to say that it does exist. Yeah, and that's why I said that. use deductive yeah. yeah. reasoning. So let's use deductive reasoning now. I asked you. I think that was the reason I asked you about the universe. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. You, because you see, you you and I agree the universe exists. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for anything to come into existence, there must be a cause. Right. Do you agree? Right. So what we already ruled out two things. One is it cannot come from nothing, it cannot come from itself. And I mean, what would be the possible characteristics of the third option? Okay. Of the third option. Of the third that it's just yeah. always existed? Yeah. It's but that has also been ruled out by so science. Not exactly. Has it? Well, yes. si no, no. does science not say like the yes. universe but came 13.8 billion years ago? expands and then contracts. Yeah, but they say small that it and then came again. from yes. a toy. By, by the way, that expansion and contraction, yeah. that's a hypothesis, it's not a theory even. No, it's not a, it's yeah. not a theory. So if, you, if something hasn't even reached the status of theory, right. it's still, a hypothesis is more like an opinion. Yeah. 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 And it could be a mathematical model, yeah. or it could be a philosophical reasoning. Right. But it doesn't mean that it's something that the, the scientists ex accept. Yeah. They, I think the majority do accept the model of the, uh, the Big Bang Theory, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. The reason for that is because they can actually prove mu much of it. Yeah. yeah? Through, uh, uh, I think, uh, through background radiation, yeah. isn't it? All those things they yeah, can measure. Yeah. yeah. So they, they got a lot of evidence to make sure that this theory has reached the status of theory. Right. It's not just an opinion anymore. Right. So you, you can't say it's eternal because the, every evidence that points to is that fact that it had a beginning. 
Like even if you think about multiverses, each of those will have a beginning as well. And so you can't say that this expansion contraction, you know, there are many theories like that. No, Sorry, many, many opinions like that. I'm just saying that maybe we've only gotten the theory back in time so far. Maybe there's further back that yeah. we are yet to discuss. You know what is the, the biggest, um, I would say, hurdle in these kind of theories, which okay. talk, with this kind of opinions, which talk about uh, eternal universe, yeah. is entropy. You know entropy? Yeah. 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 So everything, obviously, you know, it, the, the energy decreases right. to such an extent where it's unusable now. Yeah. And this is the reason they have rejected these opinions about multiverses, right. sorry, about uh, eternal universes. Right. right. So even scientifically, like I said, they would come to the conclusion that it had a beginning. Yes. And moreover, you know, like if we talk about um, us, you know, the intelligent species, we talk about something ha that has consciousness. How can something that has no consciousness give rise to something that consciousness? Just like how can something that is nothing, which doesn't even exist, give rise to something that it does exist? So do you believe that you know, every animal from a little ant to a big elephant has a consciousness then? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah, and ever since the beginning, that's always had a consciousness. Yeah, because, you know, we uh, what, what is consciousness? Uh, you know, I guess I would say that consciousness is the ability to look at the mirror, theory, you know, hypothetically, look in the mirror and say, I'm here, I'm alive. Self-awareness. Self-awareness, yeah. Can, can a robot do that? No. Why not? Actually, a robot can't do that. <laughs> it's that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so a robot has consciousness? No, they don't, because artificial intelligence is still a bunch of programs that they follow, isn't it? They just use... Uh, so, so, is a, so is a snail. Yeah, even a if snail a robot just... can detect itself. No, no, a snail is conscious. The reason snail is able to get its food is because it's conscious. You know, so it's 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 aware. what is consciousness to me? Consciousness is something that you, uh, any being who is aware of its environment. Yeah. So is yeah? it is a tree so, conscious? A uh, tree can be conscious, yeah, yeah, yeah. but to 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 a, to a lesser degree. Yeah. To a lesser degree because so they are of they they have different degrees of consciousness. Yeah. But I wouldn't call an atom conscious. Mm. Yeah? yeah. Like I know there are some crazy theories out there. Right. Yeah. But uh, you know, there's always going to be three yeah. <laughs> crazy theories. Like we came from aliens. Right. You know, uh, and I, I mean actually scientists who believe that. You know. Yeah, yeah. There are scientists who have postulated this kind of theory. Uh, sorry, not yeah, theories, but astronomy. but opinions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that yeah. we came from some aliens. But what I'm saying is that if you look at from all rational angles, you'll see that all of this existence today is contingent on something else. Yeah, just like the universe itself couldn't have come by itself. It has to be coming from somewhere. Something. Now, you know earlier when I asked you what would be the criteria of this, I think that entity has to be first and foremost be unlike the uh, unlike something which is temporary or contingent. Which depends. Which shouldn't. De it shouldn't depend on anything else. It should be self-sufficient, independent, eternal. At least, yeah. Uh, it should be having certain characteristics and abilities to uh, uh, for it, for uh, to have a will and to create something. Because there's a reason we have this all this existence, which came into existence. Yeah. So that entity itself should be eternal, self-sufficient, independent. It should be. Um, at least powerful and have the ability and characteristics to create things, isn't it? And a will, of course. Yeah. yeah. Because without a will, you can't do anything. So, what I'm saying is that all of this only satisfies in the case of when we read the Quran, when we read other scriptures, you know, who believe in God. It it only satisfies one entity, and that is which we call Almighty God or a supernatural being. If you have a problem with the term God, as many people actually do. Yeah. So. I mean, there has to be something outside of this universe which brought it into existence. It cannot be from the universe itself, is it? Because the universe didn't exist in the first place. Yeah, yeah. It's like a mother giving birth to itself. Right. <laughs> yeah, but then what? where did God come from? Ah, very good question, actually. Yeah. So that's the reason I mentioned eternal, one of the characteristics. Yeah. So God, anybody who says who created God, they're talking about a creation, not about the creator. Yeah. Because God is uncreated. Eternal, self-sufficient, and independent. So God can be uncreated, but the universe can't be? Yes, because okay. the universe is always dependent and contingent about so many things. Yeah. Take, for example, when you talk about the universe, you know, the universe itself is not really one entity as such. Isn't it? You because you're part of the universe. Yeah. You're part of, no, the universe doesn't have a consciousness. Do you think? 
Because well, I was going to ask you, and it's not exactly a religious. If you're talking about within the universe, there are conscious beings like right. yourself and myself, of course. Yeah. But what is the universe? The universe and the cosmos is everything that exists, isn't it? Apart from the metaphysical. Yeah. Yeah. Because the scientists haven't got the scope to deal with metaphysics. They can only deal with the naturalistic world that we see today, which is our universe, isn't it? They don't have the scope to deal with things which are non-material. Yes. Yeah, not non-physical. And that's the reason you cannot ask science or hope that science will deal with this question of, of existence before the universe. You see what I mean? Because of, I mean, even the fact that what they see in the cosmos, they're dependent on the light, isn't it? Yeah. The radiation itself is the light. But that's why I ask if the universe, you think the universe has a consciousness because, you know, after the universe is created, it's a lot of gas, the gas comes together. Yeah, so this follows the laws of physics. Yeah, so you would say that... I don't think that's consciousness. It's just the laws of physics. Your just, brain is I was just, just following asking the you, laws right? of physics. Like no, it's not. A star swirls together, right? A star swirls together and it generates heat. Would you say that the star is in a sense aware of its environment taking in these gases and kind of turning it into its ecosystem to turn into heat? Or would you say that the star is only doing that because it's impacted entirely by outside forces? No, it's, it's following the laws of nature. Like I said, the laws of nature, what does it mean? What does it mean? Like, take, take gravity, for example, yeah? Gravity, radiation, light, heat, all of these things, yeah? So they all follow laws of nature. You cannot, if, if you change few factors, yes, that particular uh, law, whatever, of law of physics or whatever it is, it wouldn't actually apply. So all of this is, is, is said, that's the reason we are able to uh, have these different uh, principles within, you know, the, the laws of thermodynamics dynamics for example yeah, yeah. why do we have that because these things are consistent all the time right. yeah so take the first law of therm thermodynamics yeah. that energy can neither be created nor destroyed in a closed environment why every time we see this the case because that is something that is defined within the law of nature what does that mean that whoever created the universe you know put these laws in there for the universe to work eff efficiently Here's something that might make us see eye to eye. Right? Yeah. So he mentioned, he said, wouldn't you think that your brain is just following? Yeah, I was just coming to that. Very yeah, good right, question, right. actually. Yeah. Well, yeah, and so, yeah, here's what I was going to yeah. say. Yeah, right, and we'll probably say the same thing, right? Is that if our brains are just following the laws of physics and they were created, you know, through the evolution of the earth and everything, and we gain consciousness, yeah. you, you know, you're probably going to say, well, who created the laws of physics that create our brains to get that way? But so I don't think the, the laws I don't think you're. And our consciousness are both the creation of God? No, no, you, yeah, of course. Everything's the creation yeah, of God. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what I'm saying, is that consciousness itself is something which science hasn't yet identified what's yes. yes. you, you must have heard the heart problem of consciousness. Yes. Now, why would they call that if it was just following the laws of nature? Right. The fact is, it's not following the laws of nature. And it comes in the realm of metaphysics. Yeah. But you yeah? don't believe that it could be following the laws of nature and still be a special creation for okay. God? Let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you have any empirical evidence for consciousness? Uh, no. Exactly. Yeah. So how can you say it's following the laws of nature then? Actually, you know, we kind of do have evidence for consciousness, right? Really? What? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can study our brains and study the electrical patterns that happen. And That's not consciousness. In a sense, we're a little bit... You're talking about electrochemical reactions. That's not consciousness. So if I... In, so that move my body you know, I can actually induce that. Shake your hand. They yeah, yeah. I can, actually, I can actually induce in your brain those, those patterns using chemicals. Yes. Fair. Yes. So that is not consciousness. Correct. So you need to identify, uh, sorry, you need to distinguish between electrochemical impulses in, uh, that is generated by the, you know, your the neurons, the cells within your brain, you they're firing conscious? hundreds of action right. commands, kind of, you can say. And that is what you're saying, but that is not consciousness. Like even you would find that pattern even in someone who is actually in a coma or someone who's unconscious. Right. Why? Because this is the general, what do you say, electrochemical impulses yeah, you yeah. see in the brain. Right. But that itself is not consciousness. So you need to distinguish the two. Okay. Sorry, you were saying? Yeah. So you think, you believe that I'm conscious because... Do you not think so? <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have no evidence that you are conscious. Exactly. That's why it's, so, that's why it's subjective. So, so, it's, so what do you have at present about your consciousness? Like only you will know yeah. what, what emotions you're feeling. For example, if I were to ask you, do you have a pet? Uh, no, I don't. No? Okay. A pet. I have a pet. Oh, what? A cat? A dog and a cat. A car, that, wow. How do you keep that? <laughs> okay. That's fine. That's going to be a, a lot of words there. <laughs> okay. So imagine your cat, your dog and cat. Yeah. If I were to ask you, do you love your your cat more or your friend more? I would say the same. They're both my friends. 
Yeah, but you would say that, but how would you prove that objectively? Who I love more? Yes. Well, that's the thing, I don't love either. I love no, no, how, whatever you feel, whatever love you feel. The question is, how would you prove that objectively? There is no objective proof for things that are subjective. Exactly. Love is a subjective. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. That's the answer. Yeah. You see? So you can, look, you can feel what, whatever you want, but only you will know. And even if he tells you that he, he loves you more than his cat, he could be lying. Yeah. Sorry, I don't mean that, no, but, no. <laughs> but you could be. You could, there's no way for you to disprove what he's saying. So you have to go by his word. His word. Yeah. That's it. And that is subjective. You know, scientific science doesn't deal in subjectivity. Yeah. That wouldn't be scientific. I have one more question for you. Yeah, it go goes on. back to, we were talking about marriage and family, and uh, he and I have hard parents, right? So, yeah. And you said that in, in the Quran, right, that I'll read here, it says that it, it is always told that the children should pay their respects to their parents, yeah. right, and show love to their parents. And then you said that we don't, right, and so because we don't see the sacrifices that our parents made to get us here. Mm. So here's a question I have. My father always... Are you sure you want to say this on camera? <laughs> no, no, it's, he can see. I don't care. Okay. Uh, no, so, so essentially my father always, he essentially not like blames me for existence, right? But he, I'm always a burden to him, right? He doesn't want to help me. He doesn't want to do anything. A lot of times, you know, when I was a kid, it felt like he didn't want me to be alive, right? He didn't want to help me. He's always saying, oh, I do so much for you, I do so much for you. And then I look at other parents and he does the very bare minimum. He's never around. I haven't talked to him in a long time. And so he, I'm going to see him next week for the first time in wow. years. It's going to be very difficult, right? And I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, so I'm at a position where, you know, I thought about just totally telling him off, saying, you know, we're nothing, goodbye, whatever, because my whole life has made it very difficult, right? Like I said, what would your advice to me? I'm, I'm not really... asking for advice, because I need advice. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm, not, I'm not really, you know, no, no, a, a parent guide uh, guy, no, no, or, or consultant. Yeah, I think, look, I look, at the end of the day, you know, when you were a child, right. both your mom and your dad, they cared for you. Right. Yeah, they brought you up. Doesn't matter how difficult you might have had. Maybe there was a reason. You know, I can't tell. I can't speak on his behalf. That's the reason I don't get into the, this kind of situations unless I listen to both the parties. Right. Then I could make an informed decision. Right. Yeah. But right now, I'm just going based on uh, yourself. Not. Right, right. I don't know what you're. View, yeah. So. No. No. Not his subjective view. Your experience only. I don't know about your dad's experience. Right, totally. I don't know what was the reasoning for his uh, absence, for example. Right, right. Don't know the reason for his behavior with you or maybe your mom as well. Right. So. It's always good to listen to both the parties. But what I would say is that at the end of the day, he's still a father. You can't change that, no matter what. You can never change that the fact that he's a biological father. Maybe he's, he's changed. How long has it been since you saw him last? Uh, two years. Oh, that's not long. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, compared to some other people that I know. <laughs> they, yeah, they, they, can't, they didn't see them for like most of the life. So it's always a difficult thing, you know, because these kind of emotions do run in the families, you know, between siblings, between parents and children, it does. But I think there is always room for compassion and forgiveness. You know, earlier you mentioned about being nice to other people. Why don't you apply the same principle with your own family? Maybe you might see him in, in a different light, you know. So if you, if, you, if you show him compassion and if you show him that you're willing to forgive, yes, maybe, you know, his heart might change. Yeah, yeah. yeah, who knows? Yeah, and, and, that, and the worst change. thing is to cut communication. Right. I think communication is key. Yeah. You should always maintain communication. Yeah. You know, even if you, have, if you, if you uh, speak to him occasionally, right. and that's fine. As long as you communicate to each other that he knows you're safe. You know, no parent, I think, deep down in the heart would want any, any harm on their children. Right. Doesn't matter how bad you think they are, right. but yeah. deep down, I think they all have this right. parental... Yeah, exactly. So this uh, this feeling about animosity or whatever you have, it might have, I don't know, something might have triggered it. I don't know what it is. That's the reason I cannot give you advice that might be helpful, but I can give you a generic worldview. Like, it doesn't matter even if it's an animal, if you're compassionate to them, they will start to like you. Yeah, you have pets, you know that. <laughs> but if you're bad to them, and if you're always negative to them, always toxic to them, and they are toxic to you in return, then this will always grow, you know, the toxicity will grow. One party has to, I would say, be humble. If one party humbles, then the other party will react accordingly. Yeah? The reason many of the marriages break down is because one part of the, well, one, one party in the, in the marriage is difficult, arrogant, 
you know, doesn't want to submit, and the other the other party is the same. Then what will happen? Yeah, you'll have you you'll have an explosion in the marriage, and this will maybe not, never heal. But if one of them says, okay, doesn't matter how bad that guy is or this woman is, yes, I'm going to be a better person. Yeah, I'm going to be a bigger person. And then maybe you know, God Almighty gives some sort of mercy to the other person, and they reciprocate in kind. See, I mean, I think negativity never really works. Yeah. Like in building relationships, if you really are committed to building relationships, right. if you really are committed in, in wanting to have a good relationship with your dad or your mom, then I think you should be the bigger person if they are not. Right. Yeah, even though you are younger than them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, even then. Because at the end of the day, you know, I think the biggest enemy and who, who actually enjoys this, you know, we believe in Satan. And Satan would love this kind of... <laughs> for me to go in and be negative. Exactly, and for him to be negative, because yeah. say one of the biggest things that Satan actually loves is breaking up families, breaking up uh, couples, breaking up marriages, and that they enjoy that because that is one of the purpose. And in the Quran, Allah says that in the Shaitan Aduwa Mubin, that he is your greatest enemy. He's the greatest enemy of whom? Of mankind, and that is what he would want. So I think we should be the bigger. What do you say? Let's be the bigger person and try to make up those things. And if you look, even if he, even during this meeting after two years, if he comes to you and he says to you that this is something, I don't want to see you again or anything, don't leave in a way where you say that, okay, that's it. I don't want nothing to do with you. All right? Leave in such a way that, it's, okay, dad, maybe you're not in the mood right now. You know, let's meet some other time. Keep that door open. Yeah. And inshallah, we say, God willing, you guys, your hearts will heal. Right. And we pray that it does. Okay? Yeah. okay? Thank you so Thank much. Anyway, you, much. you guys take care. Hashem. Yeah. Hashem. What part of the U.S. are you guys from? California. California. California.